Hey church, it is so good to be with you guys today. Thank you so much for having me in your lounge rooms in, I don't know, wherever it is that you're watching me from. Uh, Back in another life, I was a high school teacher. I taught high school English. Don't hold that against me if it was your least favourite subject. But I did teach high school English. And I remember I had to go on placement as you do when you're a university student. And I went, I got sent to the roughest school in my area. So I was absolutely terrified to go to this school. It had a reputation for staff stabbings and punch-ups and police being called all the time. Now, I had gone to this like very prissy, pristine, privileged private school, Catholic private school, my whole life from prep to year 12. So I was not prepared for the rough side of town, let me tell you. I was absolutely terrified to go to this school. And I was put um, in charge of a class, well, as a, you know, student teacher, kind of in charge of a class, of all these year 11 boys, and they were all rugby players, and they were massive. It was like a classroom full of Goliaths. It was just like these big guys. And I'm a pretty small person. If you've met me before, I'm tiny. So it was like these giants in this classroom and I had to teach them. I was incredibly nervous. And my very first lesson, I remember that I got towards the end of the lesson. It was going quite well. And one of the boys put his hand up. It was about 10 minutes to go. And he asks me, can I go and get a drink of water? And I was like, well, there's 10 minutes to go. Like, you know, you can wait 10 minutes. You're in year 11, come on. You know, wait 10 minutes and you can go like when the bell rings. Uh, so he puts his hand up again. He's like, miss, I really need water. And I'm like, you don't really need water. Like, just it, like, you'll be fine. So I turn around and I write some stuff on the board. I'm just like, you know, doing your thing as you do as a teacher writing on the board. And then I come back and turn around and this boy has made a run for it. He's actually jumped out the window um, and we're on the first floor. So perfectly safe, but crazy right? Jumps out of the window and half of his body is hanging out of the window and the other half is just his legs dangling in this classroom. So I'm holding onto his legs, like being like, get inside the classroom. And he's like kicking away. He's enormous. Um, I was absolutely just like, what am I doing in this situation? And you know, when you find yourself in dicey situations, you, you kind of get this inner dialogue going on in your head. So in, in my head, I was just thinking, all right, Priscilla, like you can handle this. You've got this, right? You are smart and you are educated. You you have a university degree. You can handle this situation. My goodness, I look back at that and I think that was just such a ridiculous thing to think, that somehow my education was going to help me deal with this kid jumping out a window, as if he was going to turn around, you know, after a couple of minutes and say to me, oh, Yes, miss, I totally forgot about your university degree. Let me climb back in there and wait till the bell rings. Anyway, he turned out to be completely fine. He got out of the window and got into a lot of trouble. But it was just crazy at the time just to think about like what my thinking was in that moment. And I think that every single person has a lean. Everyone has a lean. And by by a lean, what I mean is that We all have things in our life that we lean on. When a situation is uncomfortable or we're not quite sure about what the end result is gonna be, maybe we feel nervous about what's to come, we lean on different things in our lives for a sense of security, for a sense of confidence and a sense of safety. For me in that moment, it was my education. Maybe for you, when you find yourself in in an environment that is a, a little bit uncertain, you rely on things like the money you have in the bank. Maybe you find your security in the job that you have or the position that you hold in your workplace. It could even be the title that you hold as a mother or a father. You find your identity in that and a security in that. Maybe you believe that your health is fantastic and it will always be there for you. We lean on different things in our life for that safety, for that security that we so often crave in uncertain times. And the psalmist, you know, knew what it meant to look around them and wonder, where does my help come from? Where do I find my sense of safety and security? In Psalm 121, as we saw read out by my lovely fiance, Psalm 121 starts off with these pilgrims on this journey. Now they're actually traveling in this time and it's it's, it's actually known as the Traveler's Psalm. So as they're walking around, they're looking and they see these mountains before them. And there's a few thoughts that can come into a pilgrim's mind when they see the mountains. And the first one is the mountains could represent a place of safety and security for them. It could be a place where they can find protection from things like wolves, bears, all the things that could come and attack them, robbers. It could be a safe place to hide at night. People could come and attack them during the day, but it could be a safe place for them. So they look to the mountains and they think, maybe that's where I could go and hide. Maybe that's the place where I can find protection. 
they look to the mountains and they might feel the complete opposite. They might look to the mountains and say, this is a place of absolute fear. I'm not sure what is beyond me in these mountains. It's the great unknown. What will I find there? Will it be safe? How do I navigate this uncertain terrain in front of me? And maybe they would look to the mountains and wonder what was happening at the top of those mountains. Now, at this, in this time, in this history, in the, the time these Psalms were written, other nations would worship pagan gods atop of these mountains. There were the Baal gods of things like rain and fertility. They would do sacrifices on top of these mountains. So when the Psalmist says, I look to the mountains, he's also saying like, I'm doing what everyone else in my community and my society does. The people who worship the pagan gods, they look to the mountains and they wonder if they're helping is there, you know, and he's asking himself, himself, everyone else seems to be getting the security from these mountaintops. Should I also be looking to this mountaintop for my security? And the psalmist then pauses and looks inward asking, where does my help come from? And this is really the core question of Psalm 121. It's what it grapples with the most, the thesis statement, if you will. Where does my help come from? Does it come from seeking protection from the space around me? Does it come from knowing what's ahead in the journey and figuring out what's gonna happen next? Does it come from where other people in my society find their security? And what comes next is this mighty declaration, all these declarations about how great God is and who God is for His people. It says in Psalm like 121 verse two, it says, my help, comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Firstly, this Psalm speaks to the grandness of God, the God of the big, the God of the big details, who is bigger than the mountains in front of us, bigger than the circumstances we find ourselves in. He is greater than all those things. We might be looking at the mountains that surround us, but what this Psalmist says is, no, 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 I will not be shaken by that because I know who made those mountains. He is the creator of heaven and earth. He is the creator of those mountains and everything must bow down to Him. Like I said earlier, in those days, people found their security sometimes at the top of these mountains. They would go to those places and worship and they would worship idols and they, they would worship these false gods. And they believed that that was the way that they would get close to what they wanted their life to look like. They would worship things that were not of God and not of Yahweh as a source of comfort for them. And I think that sometimes, you know, we actually fall into that trap as modern day people. We can look to the things around us and we can look to those things to comfort us as well, the things that are not of God. And we make idols out of these, these, these things that we put our hope and our trust in. Money, relationships, position titles, the comfort of routine, And they become like these false gods to us. They become these places of security for us when really our security is found in God, the provider of all these things. I have to tell you, church, if I'm just gonna be really honest with you, I was so challenged by this thought at the beginning of COVID, way back in March, you know, like I can't believe that it was way back in March. It felt like this year has lasted 10 years. But back in March, I remember we went to our first weekend where we couldn't have church. And I was here hosting that weekend with Ben and we were out in, in, a, in a room doing our hosting thing. But I walked into the auditorium at one point and it was completely empty. You know, no people there, nothing there. It was just this dark auditorium. And I started to cry. I just felt so overwhelmed with grief that our church was no longer the church. And that's what I genuinely thought in that moment. And then I, I went home and, and, you know, the coming weeks I would be sitting at home during worship and I would be, you know, trying to lift my hands in worship and trying to sing out loud and, and it just felt really awkward and it felt uncomfortable. A little bit like, well, this isn't church. You know, this isn't a real church experience. And what I realised in that moment through processing that is I actually have got it all wrong. Like the church isn't about the building, as great as that is, as powerful as that is. It's actually about the people of God being mobilised and giving all of my heart to all of who He is. And I don't need a building to do that. And I realised I'd made an idol out of this weekend experience, this weekend experience with the lights and the sound and, and it had become this place of comfort for me and made an idol out of the comfort of the weekend routine routine of coming to church. 
And I really had to think, am I here worshipping God because of who God is? Or am I worshipping Him because of where I am? Is it because of who He is or where I am? I had to grapple with that. I had to surrender that to God. And I had to come and repent before Him and respond to who He is because of who He is, not because of that false idol that I had of comfort around worship. You know, it's interesting when our world gets shaken, when, when the world gets rattled, we see what really stands at the end of it. And God always stands at the end of it. And the pilgrims get this. While others are worshipping these false gods, while they're finding their comfort in the gods that maybe produce rains and crops that actually don't, the pilgrims know that it's actually God, Yahweh, who is the true source of all things. And that same God is the same God today. That God of the ancient of days is the same God today, the true source of everything where we can put our hope in and nothing should come between that for us. The second point that this Psalm makes is, it speaks to the intimacy of God, the God of the details. It goes on to say in verses three and four, it says, He will not let your foot slip. He who watches you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber or sleep. Now, there's a few things going on in this passage, in these verses here. And we have to remember that these guys were travelling to Jerusalem. So it was a dangerous road. It wasn't like this beautiful paved roads we have today. You know, we can go hiking and it's, you know, quite nice. These were like dirt, dangerous areas to walk on. And so what the psalmist is saying is that even though God is in charge of the grandness of making the heavens and the earth. He's also the God of the intimate details. He might make all of this grandness that's around me, but He is so intimately involved in my life that He cares so much about the place, even the place where I would put my foot. That is how intimately involved is He in my experience. And that goes on to speak of a God that does not slumber or sleep. And what I love about this is that uh, the psalmist is being so smart here. He's actually pr providing a sharp contrast between the gods, the pagan gods of those days, who sometimes had to be woken up to answer prayers. And he's saying, well, actually my God is not like those gods that you put your hope in at the top of the mountains. My God is not only the creator of those mountains, but He's actually the intimate God that watches me 24 seven he doesn't sleep and he doesn't slumber and I can always rely on him to be my provider. And these verses also introduce the watchful nature of God. He who watches us, he who does not slumber. The word watches, the word keep in the Hebrew is shamar, shamar. And it means to, to keep, to care, to guard. And it's someone that watches over it. And it relates to this concept of God being a guardian over His people. It's repeated six times in verses, uh, from verses three to verse eight. And you can see it there on the screen. It says, watch watches, 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 keep, watch, watch. So it's this repetitive theme that goes through this Psalm of God being our watcher and our keeper. In verses five and six, it says, the Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand, at your right hand, and the sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. And this is really speaking to the, the absolute care and protection that God provides, that shamar over His people. For starters, the right hand was the dominant hand that people used. So in battles in those days, the right hand was the one that would wield the sword, the one that was fierce and strong. So this protection, this care, this guarding that God provides for us is one that is fierce, it's one that is strong. The right hand was also the hand where the king would wear his ring. Then the ring would symbolise his authority as the king. So the right hand that God is protecting us with is a hand of authority. It's a hand of that is reliable, that we can rely upon. And finally, the right hand was the hand that a father would use to extend out over his son to give blessing over him. It is this hand of blessing. It is an intimate hand. It is one that is intimate in the family. And it shows this, this closeness to God, a family-like closeness, where God would protect us like one of His own as sons and daughters of the Most High. And finally, Finally, this Psalm speaks to the God of the always, the God of the always. So He's this mighty God, this huge God over heaven and earth, so intimate, like a father to a child, watching where our foot goes, but He's also the God of the always. 
And the verses that lead up to the final verses speak of an always on nature of God. He's always on. And you can have a look there on the screen in verses three to eight. It says, He will not slumber. He doesn't slumber or sleep. He will not harm you by day or by night. You know, it encompasses the whole day, 24 seven. The Lord will keep you from harm. He will watch over your life and He will watch over your coming and going now and forevermore. It's this repetitive theme that we're picking up in this Psalm that God is always, always at attention to His people. The final verses of this Psalm really bring this home. They really sum it up. It says, the Lord will keep you from all harm, not just some, all harm. And He will watch over your life, not part of it, your whole life. And the Lord will watch over your coming and your going. You see that it's encompassing a whole journey, both now in the present and forevermore. It's a promise for today and it's a promise for the things to come. Now, does this mean that bad things won't happen to us? Well, no, it doesn't. You know, the Bible even promises that life in this life, we're gonna have many troubles. And I know some of us are feeling that today. But what it does promise is that God will keep us in times of trouble. I love how David Barker explains it. He says, it's apparent that while the Psalms speak of such blanket protection, the pilgrim must understand that everything that invades his or her life is under God's watchful care and providence. So while bad things do happen, and they do happen, church, they happen under His watchful eye, under His supervision, and He promises to keep us close to Him in those times of trouble, both now and forevermore. It's an absolutely phenomenal promise. And I like how David Kidner sums it up. He writes, it's hard to decide which half is more encouraging. The fact that it starts from now or that it runs on, not to the end of time, but without end. This magnitude in Psalm 121, it really, it describes the magnitude of God, the intimacy of God and the eternal nature of God. And no more so is this magnitude of God, intimacy of God and eternal nature of God better summed up than in the life of Jesus Christ. This Psalm points to the person of Jesus. Think about it. Jesus Himself was God of all creation as well. He was God, the maker of heaven and earth, but He was also so intimate that He would come and dwell amongst us, that He would breathe and break bread amongst us, an intimate relationship. And the one, because He conquered death through His resurrection, He lives forevermore. He is all those things, the grandness of God. He is the intimate nature of God. And He is also the forever God, the always on God through His death and resurrection. You know, when life gets tricky, church, we can look to the mountains and we can say, where will I put my hope in? Where will I put my, my trust in? Where will I put my faith in, in these times? And we can, we can look for it. We can see what other people are doing and we can try to make up our own ways of finding safety and we can become unsure. We can look to all these things in the world for comfort in these times but we only need to look at Jesus as our source and our Saviour in these moments. The resurrected King, the one who always has been, who continues to be in the now and will continue to be in the future. He continues to reign, He continues to defy, He continues to sit on that throne. And His promises remain the same. He has not changed, church. In this season, we might be shaken. We might be confronted by the mountains, but God has not changed. Jesus has not changed. He is the same God of the Ancient of Days as He is today. The one that does not slumber, the one that does not sleep, and the one that continues to keep His people both now and forevermore. This is the promise that He makes to us. And I wonder, church, in this season, in this season of so much uncertainty, can we be a people that when we look to the mountains, instead of being overwhelmed by these mountains, we can instead turn our eyes upon Jesus and declare that He is enough, that through His life, through His death and through His resurrection, I can believe that He is with me in every part of this journey. Through Jesus, not even death can defeat us.
Can we be a people that would declare that when I face a mountain, my faith is in Jesus. My hope is in Jesus. My trust is in Jesus. My joy is in Jesus. My peace is in Jesus. My delight is in Jesus. My provision is in Jesus. My security is in Jesus. My healing is in Jesus. My freedom is in Jesus. My salvation is in Jesus. My all, my everything is in everything is in in none but Jesus, is in none but Jesus, because He is the true source of life. Come on church in this season, can we be a church that rises up and believes that even though the world is shaken, even though our world is so shaken, we will look to the maker of the heavens and earth, the one that does not let your foot slip, the one that does not let the sun harm you by day or the moon by night and believe that He will keep us in the now and forevermore. Let's be a church that declares this in this moment, not only to ourselves, not over in our family, but to the people in our community, ones that put faith in who Jesus is. You know, I know so many of us are grappling with this in this season and we're grappling with things that we never expected to grapple with and our faith has been shaken. But can I encourage you today, take a step towards Him. Take a step towards Jesus and believe that He can be your all, your everything, none but Jesus. I know for some of you, you've never made this decision to draw close to Him, to say yes to Him. And maybe you've stumbled across this message somehow. I just wanna encourage you today, get to know Him because He so much wants to know you. He wants to be your provider. He wants to be your protector. And I'm gonna take a moment to pray for all of you today. For others, I know that this has been a really challenging season. Maybe you've actually found yourself pulling away from God in ways that you never expected. You've actually taken steps back rather than steps forward and you've pulled away from Him. I really felt in my heart that there's some people who are gonna be watching tonight that 2019 was an incredibly difficult year for you and you've come into 2020 and you're wondering, God, why is this year like this? Like this is not what I needed this year. And I just, I felt that so strongly that there's people out there who are just feeling these waves of disappointment crash over them again and again and again. And it just feels like you're drowning. And if that's you, I just wanna encourage you to just come up to the surface and take a breath and breathe in all that God has for you all of the hope that He has for you. I know that this season is challenging and I know that it can feel like it's never going to end, but it will end. All seasons come to an end. And I promise you that God will still be there at the end of it, that He is still faithful, that He still wants to meet with you. Can I encourage you to trust Him again, to reach out to Him again? find your comfort and your peace in Him. And for others, I know that this season has been one where you've really felt incredibly shaken. And you maybe realised, a bit like I did, that you've put your hope in the wrong places. You've put your worship in the wrong places. Maybe you've been worshipping the experience rather than the true God behind those experiences. Can I encourage you to just come back to Him in those moments? Come back to Him with your all. Come back to Him with your heart. Come back to that place where He was your first love, when He was your greatest comfort, when your heart sang songs of pursuit of Him as you pursued Him, not because of the environment that you found yourself worshipping in, but because He was always the one that pursued you. Church, let's pray. God, I just thank You so much that even though everything is shaken, You have never left us, You have never failed us and You never will fail us. God, I pray for people who would be coming to know You for the first time, that would You would just make Yourself real to them, that You would meet them in that place, that they would feel Your presence, God, and give them good people around them to come and gather and lead them in this decision to follow You. Lord, I also wanna lift up people that have pulled away from You and wanna come back to You today. I pray, Lord, 
that You would just comfort them right now, particularly the ones that have been left in a place of disappointment and discouragement. Let them see the light at the end of the tunnel, God. Let them see You in this season. I pray, Lord, that you know in the coming days, there would be moments where they would be, oh yes, that's You, God. You've never left me. You've never failed me. God, I pray for courage and resolve to stir in their hearts in this moment as they come back to You, Lord. God, just give them comfort where they need it. And Lord, I pray for those of us who have made this experience of coming to You something that isn't about You, God. I pray that You would help us to always keep our eyes on You, to declare that there is none but Jesus that we need. I thank You so much, God, for Your love, Your grace, Your forgiveness, Your comfort and Your strength, God. I thank You that we could be a people that would worship You with absolute joy in our hearts, no matter where we find ourselves, because we know who You are, God Almighty, the Maker of heavens and the Maker of earth. We thank You so much, God, for Your goodness. And we continue to praise You in this season, God. We thank You that You do not fail and that You are still God and You are still on that throne. In Jesus' Name we pray, Amen.
Jesus, crucified to save. 